as we begin. Uh, Father God, I am so excited to be with my friends again and to get an opportunity to open your words and read the, the, red, the red letter words, you know, the words of Jesus. And Jesus, would you help us? We want to know what you want us to know in your teaching. And so we're going to endeavor to keep our hearts and minds and spirits available to you uh, for that. And, and Lord, just before we begin our study time, we want to lift up Linda Green, Linda and her mother, and uh, just ask, Lord, that you would, you've blessed this lady with 98 years of life, and, and you hold her in your hand. Would you take good care of her, please? Uh, as she, especially as she's, she's there alone, would you have some nurses or somebody there just uh, be a real come alongside for her and encourage her and for Linda as she waits that her spirit would rest in yours, would find comfort and peace in that. And Lord, for my son, Michael and his girlfriend, Nayla, that uh, the seeds that were planted, that you would have your Holy Spirit just pour water and sunshine all over at that, that they would uh, uh, bloom and bear much fruit uh, in your time. Draw them to yourself, please. And Lord, uh, praying for Madeline. Uh, Maddie's just got allergies or kicking her around. And Lord, I just ask that you would have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of her body calm those things so that she can be, uh, she can participate in the things that she wants to, like this study, for instance. Thank you, Jesus. Be blessed in what we do in our time together tonight. Be glorified, please. Help us do it with pure hearts uh, that you would have all the glory in it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good, good. All right. Well, you had a good study last week with Pastor Don. I watched it and it was good to, you know, to see that you all were there participating with it. Let's pick up uh, uh, with chapter 5 of Matthew, starting in verse 43, 43 to 48. <clears throat> last, last time, I think you, you all talked about how it's not an eye for an eye, it's not a tooth for a tooth. Uh, and now in these verses, Jesus is, is actually going to raise the bar uh, a, a little bit higher. Um, you know, last, last session, you talked about how in the, in the tribal world, uh, back in the Old Testament times, it was, you, you punch out my eye, I kill you. Uh, you hurt someone in my family, I wipe out your village. <laughs> so we got, to the, we got to the Old Testament, and we, we made it more um, equitable by saying, okay, let's, let's make it a little more, you know, an eye gets an eye, a tooth gets a tooth. Uh, and Jesus, as you recall last week, said, no, not even beyond that. Wow. So now he's going to raise it one more level for us. So here we are, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard it, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you only greet, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Did anybody happen to take the time to try and find the verse that says in the Bible that says, "Hate your hate your enemies"? Anybody, anybody, anybody try it? No, no, because you wouldn't have found it. <laughs> okay. Uh, unlike some uh, verses before where Jesus makes a direct quote of a scripture, you know, do not murder, or makes an inference or a summarization of a scripture, talking about divorce, for instance. Here, uh, he, he's kind of playing off of the... Uh, the implication that if I'm supposed to, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if I love my neighbor, I guess that means I hate my enemy. And that was the inference that people took away from that. 
And I suppose if you're reading a little bit of the Old Testament there, um, you come across some Psalms where David is pretty explicit about take my enemy and squish them, uh, in other words, which might imply hate your enemies, but you're not going to find a verse for that. So here's Jesus speaking to a Jewish crowd. And, you know, he says, I want you to, you know, I want you to love your enemies. Who are the enemies of the Jewish crowd sitting around Jesus's feet? When he says, love your enemies, they immediately think of what peoples or groups of people? The Romans. The Romans, for sure, because they were the occupying country. Samaritans. 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 Oh, we know they, we hate the Samaritans. Okay. Anybody, any others, you think? I guess anybody that wasn't part of the of them. I mean, okay. Wasn't Jewish. Exactly. Yeah. Any Gentile will do. <laughs> yeah, for okay. that matter, yeah. yeah. They they just saw it in a framework of my neighbor is always someone within my Jewish environment and everybody else is an enemy. And some people are more enemy than others, like the Romans or the Samaritans, for instance. Okay, who are your enemies? If we're going to make an application right away, love your enemies. Who are your enemies? So, oh. Sometimes people that don't think like us or believe what we believe. Okay. I guess. <laughs> no, good. Um. I... I posed this question to some of the young men that I text every Monday. Oh, it's been a few weeks now, but I, you know, I, I posed that question about a, a challenge to, to, you know, think about who your enemies are, because if we're going to pray for them, we need to know who they are. And that was a really interesting that a lot of the guys texted back and said, I, I just never have given any thought to that. And once I did, you know, once I kind of brought it to prayer and said, God, uh, I don't think I have any enemies, but I can, I can trick myself. Would you reveal to me people I think or I view as enemies? And it became a really interesting interaction with God. So who, who might, what might be an application you think for us to love our enemies? I would say we could look at anyone that is that has different morals and beliefs than us and uh, goes offends us purposely, intentionally bullies our loved ones or ourselves. Anyone that you know is violent, whether verbally or uh, abusive in any yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Although I don't know we're very, I hope we're not very aggressive or intentional. I, it kind of goes back a little bit to what Ileana was saying about the Jews. Anybody that wasn't in the Jewish community, anyone that was outside the perimeter, gee, kind of became an enemy. And I wonder sometimes if that's not, you know, a, a tempting to us to say anybody that's outside of my circle, whether it be my religious circle or my political circle or my whatever circle, uh, they're just they're just the enemy. Anyone who is not a Christian? Well, that doesn't have your beliefs, I mean, or whatever that is, political yeah. or or you know, faith or whatever. No. People's bosses. <laughs> 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 they feel I I I feel like uh, that happens at workplaces too. There's there's uh, clicks and there's little, you know, they make clicks inside of the the job, and they become like an enemy. Is that kind of a low bar for the definition of enemy? 
Um, I'm sitting here trying to figure out if I can draw a distinction even between an adversary and an enemy. Because I have people who are in my life who are seem like adversaries, but I certainly don't consider them enemies. Yeah. Yeah. So I I apologize for being a little bit late. I escaped, so don't pay the ransom. Um, Nope. Good. Did we define enemy? No, we were waiting for you to show up, John. I'm here. (laughs) So so I could be the example of enemy. Um, (laughs) Someone who delays us. Yeah. So before you arrived, we 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 kind of made a circle about who might be the enemies to the Jews. Ah. Uh, you know, and we said, well, it would definitely the Romans, maybe the Samaritans, perhaps the Gentiles, and that pretty well made it a circle of everybody that wasn't a Jew. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead, Debbie. For me, it's easy riding a motorcycle. It's all the people in their cars that have their face glued to their phone and aren't watching or looking at all for me, and I have to, you know, avoid, you know, like the plague. Yeah. Deb? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Debbie, you're muted. Yes, you, I hit the space bar. It was supposed oh, to unmute. There we go. Okay. Um, a person who is actively opposed or hostile to someone or something, which could be an adversary too. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, I think maybe he's just taken it to the absolute extreme. Okay. You've heard it said, love your neighbors. Got that one, Jesus. And hatred means, I'm telling you, love your enemy. Love the one that absolutely opposes you. Love the one and pray for the one who persecutes you. Okay, so love my neighbor, pray for my enemy. And then I think we live to a great degree with everything in between that says, well, I haven't got any real enemies. Yeah, and Jesus would say, but who are you loving? Well, I'm, I'm loving the people who go to my church. Good. I'm loving the people that think like me. Well, good. You know, but I think Jesus might say, but what about the people that they're not really actively opposing you, but they're, they're just different than you? Well, I don't hate them. No, no. Jesus says, that's not what I asked. My question was, who are you loving? And if I, if he takes me to the extreme and says, love your enemy, what's that mean about everybody else in between that is obnoxious? Uh, <laughs> uh, all the things that John kind of talked about. I was, as, as I read through this this week, I went back and I, I tried to find a legitimate Old Testament command uh, or direction from God to yeah. hate your enemy. And that does not exist. So this is a, this seems to be a, a human enhancement or a, a, a human doctrine, not a God doctrine. Is that accurate? That, that is, you know, to the man who was late, that was, that is very accurate. <laughs> uh, that uh, you won't find that verse. And you know, we talked about the implication, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor, then I obviously I'm supposed to hate my enemy. And that, that was an implication, not a directive. Oh, I inter- uh, interject here? Yes, please. I see you've got a scripture there, Brian. That is generally what is one of them that's re- defined to or referred to, because he does say, you have heard that it was said, and that phrase is normally said, meaning that he's quoting from the law or the Torah. And then he says, um, so it has to be somewhere, or it was Jewish interpretation of somewhere. This is one of them. Basically, any one specific groups of non-Israelites that had turned against the Israelites when they were coming into the promised land. And God ah. later, you know, annihilate them, destroy them. But it, it is a, a, a bit of an, in, you're, you're right, it's an oblique reference. Yeah, yeah. And you know how you know how we do with oblique references? We turn them into concrete, you know. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah, and then it, then we get into all kinds of trouble. So wait, what, what's what's you're saying that in the Old Testament there's nowhere where it says to hate your enemy, but we're saying that that means that 
it didn't say not to that there were no commandments to go and destroy towns and places because that happened oh there were obviously and the old testament especially is when they entered of... the, the promised land they like took over yeah and 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 i, I don't by force I, I didn't mean to say that it doesn't appear anywhere in the old testament yeah. um what i was trying to say was i couldn't find it in in the outline of god's laws yeah um, you know, it, 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 there's, there's places in Psalms and other places where it talks about vengeance and, uh, man-made vengeance, um, you know, that, that gets into hatred and, and, and that kind of anger. Um, so not that it doesn't say it anywhere in the old Testament, I just couldn't find it in God's law. Yeah. As an instruction, like to yeah. have ill feelings towards people. Yeah. And even if it were, even if we could have found a chapter and a verse, that Jesus could have quoted here in this portion of, you know, the sermon, I, in light of his don't murder, don't commit adultery, I think Jesus would have said, you've heard it said, you know, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, and he's got a chapter and a verse, but I think he would have followed it just the same. But I tell you, new covenant, new people, new approach, the essence of this is going to be love. All the things I've talked about before in the message, everything I'm going to talk about afterwards in the Sermon on the Mount, it all is is focused and centered on on love, and it's and it's not the ushy gushy love. It's that same love that took Jesus to the cross, right? The agape mm -hmm. love, the unconditional love, the love of choice. I choose to love because loving an enemy is not a feel good. Woohoo, boy! I had a great day. I was loving my enemy. Woo! No, we know it doesn't work that way. And yeah. A lot of mercy and grace goes into that. Yep. Yep. And I guess since he was about to open up that door to mercy and grace through the new covenant and the atonement, they needed to follow suit. Yep. If they wanted to receive it, they had to share it as well. And and last week, you reviewed a little bit with Don, and this has kind of been our theme from the very beginning. These are not a list. This Jesus is not giving us a, a new list of commandments. Jesus is giving us uh, examples. He's saying, people who are Christ followers, people who follow me, who are my disciples, this is what their lives look like. Uh, they don't hate their enemies. They love their enemies. They pray for their enemies enemies um and and why why jesus says here's why you ought to do it you should do that so that you can be children of your father what do you think jesus meant by that love your enemies pray for them so that you can be children of your father well then you can be part of the family of god family of jesus Okay. Sons, son of somebody, okay, uh, is, is you find it a lot through the Old Testament, New Testament. And, uh, you know, son of God implies to some, at least to some extent, implies has the characteristics of his father or, you know, so when we are sons and daughters of God, children of God, Jesus is saying, love so that you can be like God. That's what God is like. Be like God. And he starts to allude, you know, and he says, if you just love those who love you, what reward is that? Even tax collectors do that. He's going to start talking about rewards a little bit. Uh, as if there is something that occurs negatively or positively based on our, our actions. And what does he say for the people who, you know, he says, uh, tax collectors, people who greet all their own people, he says, good gravy, even pagans do that. That's, that's not a big challenge. That's not a big deal. But instead, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. All right. What do you think about that one? 
That's a long shot. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, that's a pretty tall bar to clear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Hal said, Hal says his wife is perfect. Well, okay, good. That, well, he's yeah. right. Yeah, I do. Me too. Right. Me too. I'm saying my wife is perfect too. <laughs> yeah. And you do the same thing. <laughs> You guys better. <laughs> well, you know, I I did a lot of reading about about this, and and one of many of the discussions centered around you. You and I are never going to be perfect. We we established that, you know, early on. Uh, yeah. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Paul tells us in Romans. So, you know. He's not countermanding Jesus, but you know all, all of the people I read that were looking at the language said this is this perfection. A thing is perfect if it fully realizes the purpose for which it was planned, and designed, and made. And one of the illustrations was like I've got a Phillips head screw that needs to be screwed into the wall to hold something in place. And the perfect tool for doing that is, well, at least a manual Phillips head screwdriver or my Ryobi drill with a Phillips head. Somehow, though, you know, the perfect tool is, is not the flathead. It's not a wrench. It's not. It's a screwdriver with a Phillips tip. And because that is the purpose for which it was planned and designed and made. And perhaps part of what Jesus is saying to us is, I, you know, be, fulfill the purpose for which you were planned, designed, and made. And that is to love, love. other human beings, just like your father loves all human beings. Be perfect in your love as God is perfect in his love. That's a pretty high standard. Mm-hmm. But sometimes high ideals create strong incentives. Exactly. We have to aim high, right? So we can at least accomplish something. Yes. We're not going to be like him, but we have to aim to be like God. Yeah. In love. Yeah. I don't, I don't think Jesus ever wants us to rest on our laurels to say, well, you know, I've come pretty far. I'm a lot better than I was. Uh, I'm definitely a lot better than John. So I'm, I must be there. Um, but you know, but to continue to keep, to keep the, the goal to be like Jesus, you know, be perfect as Jesus is perfect. Any other thoughts about loving the enemies, praying for them? Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Let's read one verse next. Look, we made it to chapter six. Wow. We're screaming, screaming along. Verse one of chapter six, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. What is Jesus first assuming? here that you're doing something righteous <laughs> that we're going to be doing something righteous yeah. okay and so isn't it interesting that jesus is he's talking to people who want to do the will of god and he doesn't have to tell us to be good although he probably should but he's he's not telling us to be good what is he concerned about then he assumes we're going to do good, but don't be prideful. Our motives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Watch those motives. Yeah. Because I I I tell people very often that God gives gifts to his children. Anger is actually a gift. Fear is a gift. Uh, Satan is aware that he cannot take 
away the gifts that God has given to his children, but he is going to do his best to distort them. Or use them to his purposes. Yeah. Yeah. That subtle abuse. Jesus, Jesus is saying, you know what, kids? You can even abuse good deeds. Mm -hmm. If they're done for motive or for the wrong motives. And all of a sudden, our entire life comes under scrutiny. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So we can't rename the church sanctuary, the John Malloy Memorial Sanctuary? <laughs> I'll answer that one. No. <laughs> In honor of the $1 million you're contributing to the church? Yeah, what a guy. Wait, wait, wait. Who cut the check in half? <laughs> and, in fact, thank you for that segue into giving, Brian Migliazza. Okay? And, in fact, having made this statement about, I know you're going to do good things, but please be careful that they don't subtly get, you know, abused. Oh, oh, Jesus. Ooh, ooh. Let me give you some examples. And so he enters into a first set of verses about how to, and in some cases how not, how to give. Uh, anybody happen to have uh, uh, chapter 6, verses 2 through 4 open and mind reading them in an unmuted fashion? Yep. So uh, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by the others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you, your giving may be in secret. Let me put my glasses on. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Great. Thank you, Hal. Yep. Okay, here, let's... Let's first, let's define hypocrites. You know, when you give to the needy, don't do it as the hypocrites do. Anybody remember a Greek translation of hypocrite? An actor who wears a mask. Oh, yeah. An actor who wears a mask. You know, who he really is might get covered up in a outward presentation. And Jesus is just going to use that word over and over and over in these verses. He's, you know, he's going to talk about people who are one way on the inside, but present a different way on the outside. And he starts with giving their, their alms or their giving to the needy, uh, which was, you know, expected, or at least historically for the people. Let's, we're going to break down these verses by using, <clears throat> okay, all right, you're going to have to look really close here. Okay. I'll turn, I'll turn me a little bit. Is this an electronic screen? Are you sharing your screen there? Yeah, this is, this is me sharing my whiteboard. Put it on you the know? speaker view and you'll be able to see it. I tried to figure out how to do that, you know. Upper right hand corner, just click on view and then put speaker view and You'll see it. Yeah. And, and it's only because I'm going to say it out loud, and you can probably hopefully pick it up as we go. We can, one commentator said, let's look at these verses in light of this kind of framework. The observance. So, so when you give to the needy, okay, that's, that's the observance. Then the prohibition, Jesus says, okay, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do, which is kind of like, don't go out there and do it by blowing your own horn. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I can't help but think of John and his so far, so far, you know, you know, here, when he gives, when he gives his $2 million gift, Brian, then it, there it'll be. All right. <laughs> and what is their intent in giving it in the synagogues with the trumpets? 
to be honored by others. Okay, move to the next one. What's their reward when they give that way? They've already got their reward. And what is that, Hal? Being honored. Oh. Yep. The accolades of the people around them. Yeah. People looking, people talking. Look at John and his $2 million gift. We will name the auditorium for him. Okay. And jealousy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And okay. And so that's the reward. What is the alternative observance in those verses? Alternative observance? Yeah. Can you stay in the verses? But when you give to the needy. Yep. Not enough. When you give, well, how are you supposed to give? What's an, instead of doing it with trumpets out in the streets, Jesus says, do it without quietly. Your, yeah, without your left hand knowing what the right hand's doing, do it quietly. Okay. And, and what is the Father's reward when we do that? They see, he sees what we do. And he will, yeah. And he'll reward us. Okay. And I don't know what that reward is like. Any any thoughts? I would say joy and peace at, at, at the least. <laughs> okay. Giving, giving joy and peace. Um, and I'd say you just what you need. You know, the Father always gives us what we need. And so he'll <laughs> he'll take care of our needs instead of letting man, you know, the man we the men we please please you know take care of what we want. Yeah. What would that word reward have meant to the people Jesus was speaking to? Would they have been thinking back to Malachi where God where, where God says, bring bring your gift into the storehouse and and I will I will use it. I mean what would they be thinking of or comparing that word reward to? Do you have any idea? No, not exactly. <clears throat> we we know that there was a perception out of the Old Testament or out of the Jewish people that uh, you know, like when you go and look at, you know, the book of Job, the perception that says, um, if I do right, then it's, you'll know it, because I'll have a big house, three cars, and a boat. Uh, if I'm not in good standing with, with God, then you'll know it, because I'll be living in the hovel, you know, down the street. And so the, the reward, you know, uh, I think they perceive rewards as if I do this, then God will do that. They were a little prosperity gospel. <laughs> I, I so think he, well, I think he left it like that, like to there, because they couldn't, there was no way to explain to them the treasure they were going to receive after the cross. That was still to come. And so that wasn't even something that they could grasp at that point. And so I think he just left it to their imagination. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to, in my mind, reconcile, would this be a physical reward or a spiritual reward in, in the terms of blessings? Like I think it might've been uh, Steve who said joy and peace and contentment and, and those fruits of the spirit. Um, I think when he, if he refers to the father's reward, it has to be a good, you know, good, a good thing. And it could be spiritual or physical. It could just be, you know, on a case to case basis. Uh, but overall, anything that the father was going to give them was going to be something good because it's a reward. It could be acknowledgement, it could be anything that they needed or their heart desired. You know, this, uh, this kind of comes back to something that we're doing in the purpose driven life and of the five purposes. And the first is planned for God's pleasure. Second is planned, you were formed for God's family. Third, created to become like Christ. Fourth, shape for serving God. And fifth, made for a mission. So this all kind of fits together, you know. 
it's he's kind of like saying uh, it's it's like that's what your purpose is is to serve God and to help those who are in need and to be your brother's keeper etc cetera, etc cetera, you know that's your purpose okay Jesus Jesus makes a differentiation between the the hypocrites who get a reward of acknowledgement or praise or whatever and the believer who gives in secret so that nobody is aware of that except God and God rewards him so we've got some kind of a parallel thing I think a little bit where you know if I if I do it to get the admiration of men, I will probably get the admiration of men. Mm-hmm. And God will say, I, what sacrifice? Yeah. But if I do it to get the, the, the acknowledgement and the admiration of, if you will, of God, then the reward is I will get the admiration and acknowledgement of God. Now, how that plays out in my life you know, specifically versus your life versus 15 years ago versus today versus 10 years from now. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I was just checking the reference that the the says here right now. I mean, in that verse in, that Paul talking to the Colossians and um, 323 it relates to that. It says, whatever you do, work it, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So the, inher- the reward is the inheritance from the Lord. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It all comes down to the motivation of why you're doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So much so. You, we might take from this that don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You know, oh, Jesus is telling us that our gifts must always be anonymous and secret. And yet, you go to Acts and you find uh, uh, in Acts 4, you find Barnabas. Remember, the church is all living together, supporting one another. You find Barnabas who sells some land and brings the money to the apostles' feet. Well, obviously, it was not secret because he brought it to the apostles' feet, and it's written in the letters that got circulated. Oh, but a few chapter, a chapter later in Acts 5, two other individuals bring their gift publicly. And they turn into toast. Okay. Ananias and Sapphira. What's the difference between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira? Barnabas brought it for the kingdom of God. Well, and, and the others too, but they they lied. I mean, they. they yeah. They yeah. Lied. And Ananias and the wife lied and hid some of their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right, Peggy. That's right. You know? The, to some degree, they weren't bringing the whole gift like Barnabas did. They were bringing part of it, said it was all of it, and said, I would surely like the praise of men. And what they got was the condemnation of God. But both of those were, were, were public, you know, gifts that were given. So I, I'm not sure that Jesus is telling us to, that our gifts always have to be secret they always have to be quiet. They always have to be anonymous. But I do think he's really telling us, however you give your gift, the intention and the motivations are going to make all the difference in the world. If you're doing it to get the praise of men, and that's why it's a public gift, you know, then then it's not going to go well with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think not. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand doing is doing. Is this is kind of like double-minded? You know, I think he's talking about a singleness, 
uh, of heart. And the discussion of rewards, yeah, we get some of that in the Beatitudes. Blessed are, for theirs is, that's a reward. Rarely was it tangible. Oh, wait, it was never tangible. That uh, was all spiritual things. And I think here Jesus really is asking us, would you please be honest and self-aware of your fallibility? <laughs> you're, you know, again, don't take a good thing and let it become a bad thing. Okay, so that's his first example of when you do your righteous things, do your righteousness, okay? Don't do it to be seen of others. Next portion, he's going to talk about, well, now we need to talk about how to pray, not what to pray. That'll be, you know, the next section in the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, but how to pray. So verses 5 to 8, anybody got those up and ready to unmute, read them? Go ahead, Connie. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. One more, uh -huh. two more actually. Okay. Th and through eight. Pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then like this. Okay. So thank you, Connie. <clears throat> All right. So now he says, let's, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Okay. Let's, let's, let's run our, let's run our outline here again. One more time. What is the, what is the observance? When you pray. When you pray. What is the prohibition? Not be. Hypocritical. Don't be hypocritical. Don't don't uh, don't pray in front of others for the sake of others seeing you pray. Okay. You pray because you feel the spirit and you want to pray at that point, wherever you are. Okay. And don't use a lot of words that are unnecessary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So when you pray, do not pray. Uh, on the street corners to be seen by others. Well, that's the intent to be seen by others. <laughs> Do not pray on the corners to be seen by others. What's the reward when you pray on the corners to be seen by others? The fact that others saw you. <laughs> You're trying to exalt yourself. Yep. Or today you might get molested. <laughs> But he says, when you, when you, if, if you pray, you know, on the street corners, if you pray at the appointed hours, you know, there were, there were three times a day that a good Jew would pray. Okay. Uh, a morning an afternoon and an evening. And, and, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, it wouldn't be unlike some of the hypocrites to say, oh my goodness, what time is it? I've got to rush. I've got to rush out to the street corner or up to the temple so that people can hear me pray, because I pray really good with lots of words. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, the people who rush out to the street corner to do that, to be seen of men, they got their reward. I hope they had a good day, because that's all they're getting. Okay, what's the alternative observance? Instead of praying on the street corner, what's the alternative? In secret your room, going secret. Pray in secret. And when you pray in secret, what's the Father's reward? I don't know. Recognize you, they'll recognize you in public. Yeah. Yeah. They'll reward you in public, acknowledge you in public. So. Yeah, perhaps so. But again, there's that parallel. If you are praying like this to make sure that people see you, they have seen you. I hope you had a good day. But if you pray in secret where no one can see you except God, then God will see you. 
And that makes for a really good day. Mm -hmm. But the point is not where you pray. It's the purpose for which you pray in that location. Absolutely. People that pray, that go down to the altar and pray in church are going there out of spiritual love for God. Right? That's different than saying, oh, he went down to the altar, so he must be something special. That's different. Uh, yeah. They yeah. both went to the altar, but for different purpose. Yep. Yeah. And again, like the, should I only give anonymously? No, we don't see that. Jesus isn't saying you must always pray in a, in a closet. Because again, we go through the New Testament, and we, we see examples of, of people praying in public, praying out loud, and it's a good thing. Paul says, men should lift up holy hands in prayer in church. Same thing. Okay. But now we're back to the intention thing, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to say. It's not where you pray or how you pray. It's the motive for mm -hmm. praying praying out loud or whatever. It's, or it's the motive that is in your heart. At our old church, our pastor at one time, he, he, he doesn't sing. Never has, never will. He sings, but he doesn't sing well. And he said... If you're singing and listening to how other people are sounding, you're doing it the wrong way. Because that's your time with God. There's no comparison because everybody sounds and does it different. Yeah. And if you're focused on them, you're yeah. not focused on God. On God, definitely. Prayer is a good thing. And Jesus is saying, I know it's a good thing, but I just want you to be aware of how subtly it can become abused. We could take a good thing and make it a not so good thing, even a bad thing, including prayer. Isn't it interesting? He says, and then uh, yeah, he says, don't babble. Yeah, you know, that was that was a, the Gentiles and the pagans. You know, it was, I'm going to convince this God to do something. I'm going to manipulate him. I'm going to mantra this thing over and babble, babble, babble. Even the Jews, to some degree, had recited prayers that they said in those three times a day that they prayed. Uh, I can remember my dad. Uh, my dad was an elder in the church, uh, but he just not, did not like being in front of people. And when it was his turn to serve Lord's Supper communion, which was every week in the church I grew up in, uh, when it's his rotation, you you could you could recite it with him because he had that prayer that he would say in public. Now I don't think my dad was was you know many words or needlessly babbling. I think he really meant those words, and those were only the only words he knew. But sometimes Jesus is saying people think they can talk God's ear off and he'll give up and give them what they want <laughs> to some degree. Okay. Yeah. And he says, and do not be like them, the pagans trying to manipulate God with many words for your father knows what you need before you ask him, which begs the question, why pray? Jump in there, anybody. We we'll recognize that he can, he hears our, recognize that we know that he hears our prayer and he responds to our needs. We, are rec we recognize him as the authority. Okay. And I see it as kind of a, 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 in worship, it's he created us in his image. He loves us. And it's our way of loving him back. Okay. Others? Is, there, is there also an acknowledgement or a, a verbalization of what we need so that uh, there's an understanding that we know what we need? He knows what we need, but do we recognize what we need from God? Okay, good. Other what about the times that you Why? can't say anything, but he knows you can be yep. wailing and he knows 
but you're trusting him to hear what you need him to translate. Yeah. A yeah. time of confession, too. Recognizing yeah. Yeah. our faults and why pray if God already the knows? Prayer for me. <laughs> yeah. Why pray? Well, one would be because that's the way God told us we get our needs met. <laughs> it's yeah. the God-appointed way of of addressing our needs. Why pray? Well, I think sometimes prayer prepares us for the proper use of the answer. You know that God's going to answer that prayer, but my dialogues with Him prepare my heart and give me insights about what to do when the answer comes. And maybe, maybe this, maybe we pray simply because we have a father who invites us to pray. One of the things that, you know, I, I shared with you, John, you can you kind of came in a little late, but my, my, my son's girlfriend, as we were having that spiritual dialogue and, you know, again, I remind you that of that moment when she was crying and she says, I just can't conceive of a God that would want to have a relationship with me. And I think sometimes that, you know, to try to share with her that there is a God, a father, our father, who invites you, you specifically, Nayla, to come talk with him. Well, but doesn't he already know what I need? That's not the point. <laughs> it's the point of avoiding babbling. You know, babbling is trying to convince God or wear God down. And Jesus says, no, no, God already knows what you need. And then we say, well, why pray? Because God invites you to pray. And I don't think we, I just don't think we need to miss that. But again, that's, that's an intention uh, you know, and a motivation of our hearts. Okay, one, one, just Debbie. Well, I was just going to say, sometimes just the act of sharing something relieves the burden. I mean, we do that with our, with even human people, we take our burdens and we just share them. We don't expect them to fix it. We don't expect them to do anything, but just the very act of sharing it oftentimes can make the burden feel lighter. Yeah. And then to take it to the God creator that's even a step up to yeah. be able to share our burdens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're, we're going to use this again next week because after we do the Lord's Prayer, we're going to talk. He has one more section where he talks about fasting. But let me, let me leave you with one question that we can dialogue with for two or three minutes. Try to be really honest. In what ways... Do you make sure people know about your piety and your good deeds? I'll start. John will remember, some of you will remember when we were in the, uh, the aerobics or in the, the YMCA, unloading trailers, setting up church, putting church back in a trailer. Then we moved up and got to the high school where we took church out of a box, put it on the stage, took it, put it back in the box at the end. Um, John and I and many others did that for seven years every Sunday, rain or shine. And I can remember breaking down. Setting up was never an issue because nobody was there except the setup team. But breaking down... The church had just had church. It was all amen. They were all busy fellowshipping. And I wanted to go home and take a shower. And I was breaking down. And I can remember taking the, the hand cart with heavy boxes on it and clipping people's heels in the aisle to make sure they knew and recognized how hard I was working for God. Is setting up and breaking down a good deed? Yes. Not in that case. <laughs> was I abusing it? <laughs> yes. I was doing my good deed. I was doing my righteousness in a way that was like standing on the corner, okay, or, or blowing my own horn. Any other 
any other honest people want to contribute to sometime in your past, perhaps. I'm not that honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me leave you with that challenge then. That I think Jesus, you know, might be asking you and I who who you know that in the things we do that we should probably step back for a moment and look at the motivations and the manner in which we do them. Yeah. And, we, and, 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 and sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be us directly and sometimes it can be indirectly uh, back in that season when, you know, Jim and I were doing setup and breakdown every week. Um, the pastor would frequently talk about John and Jim and what John and Jim were doing. And candidly, I mean, tr transparently, when he first started saying that, words of affirmation is not one of my, one of my uh, love languages, but I'll tell you, I was digging it. I was <laughs> liking the, the press. You know, I enjoyed the recognition, the public recognition. I didn't do it for the public recognition, but I liked it. Yeah. Um, but then it wasn't too terribly long after that. You know, it would have been measured in, not in weeks, not in years, but sometime in months, it started to really wear on my heart. And I remember going to the pastor and saying, could you do me a favor? And he said, sure. I said, stop announcing the John and Jim show. Yeah. Um, this is, it, it's, it's making me uncomfortable that this, what we're doing, what we're experiencing here is becoming about us. So I did like it for a period of time. I did like it for a season. I never thought about clipping people's heels as I walked by them with the cart. Man, um, man. But, uh, you but gotta do you gotta do. yeah, but in that, in that moment, God did a work on me. Yeah. Um, so there. Yeah. And I, I think if we stop, we can see, we can see that these are relevant verses that Jesus is talking to us, that he's saying to all of us on the screen tonight, I don't have to tell you to do good deeds. You're my kids. You're going to do good deeds, but Please be very, very careful that the intentions, the motivations, and the manners that you don't get sucked into where you are doing it for the praise and the recognition of men instead of the affirmation of my of me, your father, God. Good. Good. Hey, thanks, crew. I appreciate you all showing up and contributing. And uh, next week we'll we'll jump into uh, what is called the Lord's Prayer, and afterwards a little bit about fasting, and and uh, and uh, who knows, maybe even more. But in the meantime, I I love being with you, and thank you for spending this time. A hey, uh, hey, Brian Migliazzo, would you mic up and pray for us, please? I mean, please. Thank you, Lord, for this good time together. Thank you for each person here, and I pray your blessing on them on all of us, Lord, in our marriages, our parenting of small children, children, all the issues that go with that, our finances, our health, keeping us safe from uh, COVID, Lord, helping us to be a blessing to others, to do our the acts of right you expect us to do in your strength and in your power and for your blessing, Lord, that you would, uh, we would be blessed and rewarded by you, Lord, for all that you want us to do. These are uh, acts of service that you prepared for us in advance to do, Lord. And I thank you for that. Thank you for Jim's uh, preparation and study tonight and for helping illuminate the scriptures. Guide us in this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good, good. All right, everyone. Have a good night and I'll see you Sunday. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.